Hi, I'm Ryan D'Souza, aka The Savage Vibe, and this is a new channel called Mouths Keep Talking. We are focused on podcasts, so you can say we are a podcast company. And in the coming days, you will see a lot of podcast episodes. Maybe Mouths Keep Talking Finance, Mouths Keep Talking MMA, uh, and it's going to be really interesting. But in this episode, uh, my friend Kian and me have discussed about this book. It's called Men Without Women by Haruki Murakami. So it's a, a long format video. Obviously, there'll be snippets of this specific video uh, on my ch- uh, on this new channel, and you ca- uh, guys can watch that separately. Now, if you want an in-depth look into our thoughts, you know, our emotions regarding Men Without Women by Haruki Murakami, then please watch this video. Now, I know a lot of uh, you guys might have not read Haruki Murakami's Men Without Women, right? And uh, you guys might be new viewers. And for those who have read, amazing. I want to cater to both these audiences for this specific video. So, for those who haven't read the chapter Kino or uh, Men Without Women, uh, the first 20 to 40 minutes of this video. Uh, will be an explanation video of the chapter Kino I have explained so in case if you want to skip that you can so what you can do is you can go read Kino yourself and then you can listen to me and Kian talking about uh, this beautiful book or what you can do is you can see that video it's it all depends on you or uh, you'll get a timeline so you can use those YouTube chapters basically and I hope you really really enjoy this video and uh, please do like share and subscribe and I have come to this garden to read my book Men Without Women by Haruki Murakami and what I've decided is that the last chapter which I will be reading from this book I want to share this with you all I want to share this story with you all and the reason being that this book is really beautiful in a sense that it shows how lonely a man can be and how a man struggles with love in his life and I connect to those emotions on a, at a very deeper level but we wouldn't talk about my emotions someday later we can talk about that but I want to talk about this book and I really want to do justice to the story but please understand that I have no script ready for this video all of this is just on the spot recording so whatever I feel whatever I think on the spot after reading the story or as I'm reading the story I'll be recording it and hopefully uh, we have a nice video so please do check out the book if you have time is uh, Men Without Moon by Haruki Murakami so I started reading chapter 5 that is named Kino and in the starting of the book we are introduced to ki- uh, two characters so there's this one man who sits on the same seat always in a bar and that seat isn't even that comfortable it's pretty uh, you know uh, irritating in the sense that because the ceiling is low in the bar every time that you go to stand up your head would hit the ceiling and you and the man who used to sit there at the same seat he was pretty tall so what Kino observed about this man is that he was in his mid 30s he had good cheekbones he was bald and had a good forehead he was thin but had broad shoulders so at first Kino thought that this guy this man might be from the Yakuza and if he's from the Yakuza means Kino had to be on guard so whenever this man used to appear and sit on the same seat Kino used to be on guard and what this man used to do is he used to sit on the same seat he would order for a beer and he used to read a thick book after 30 minutes of finishing reading his book he would just or he would tell Kino to order a whiskey when asked which whiskey the man would uh, reply saying that any sort of no I don't have such a preference uh, any scotch would be fine the man began coming regularly to Kino's bar once at most twice a week he would invariably have a beer first, then a whiskey. White label, equal amount of water plus a few ice cubes. Sometimes he had two glasses of whiskey, though usually restricted himself to one. Occasionally he would study the day's menu on the blackboard and order a light meal. The man hardly ever said a word. Kino didn't know the man's name, though the man knew he was Kino since that was the name of the bar. But the man never introduced himself and Kino never bothered to ask. The man was just a regular customer who came to the bar, enjoyed a beer and a whiskey, read silently, paid in cash, then left. He never bothered anybody else. 
what more did Kino need to know about him? As we go further in the story, we learn more about Kino's past. And Kino is basically this bar owner on who, and the chapter is named on him, Kino. And what happens is, before he was a bar owner, actually he was an athlete. But because of some injury, he could not be an athlete anymore. So he took a job in a sports center as a salesman and his job was of selling shoes. And even though he was not that sociable, he was good at his job because he would listen really well. So he would listen to what the athletes wanted and he would tell, go and tell the managers or the person in charge that this is what the athletes wanted. So even the athletes liked him, the managers liked him and that's why he was reliable. And even though he wasn't paid that much, he liked this job because in some sense it was keeping him closer to being an athlete, right? He could still see other athletes running and doing what they're good at. So he was not dissatisfied from his job. He really liked his job. But the reason that he left his job was because one fine day he found his wife cheating. And because he had to go outside his house more for uh, because he had to go again and again out for a sales purpose his wife had an affair with his and he wouldn't really know he was a type of man who wouldn't pick up on clues fast just because he came a day earlier at his house he realized that his wife was having an affair with his bed. And when he seen that he just closed the bedroom door he took um, his took he took all of his clothes and he just left and he never went back to his house again. So what he did was he realized that his aunt basically had a coffee shop and his aunt wanted to retire. So what he did is he called her and he asked if that coffee shop is still available. If he can still use that coffee shop, he wanted to use that coffee shop as a bar. So his uh, aunt was like, your wife wouldn't allow you to do that, right? And he said that that doesn't really matter because we are getting divorced. And the aunt and Kino had a mutual understanding. So they didn't really speak about the divorce. And that's how he opened a bar. So what happened is uh, once Kino opened his bar, for two months he seen the man who used to sit on the same seat. But he never confronted him and he never really knew his name. Then two months later what happened is Kino realized the man's name and the man didn't tell him his name directly. What happened is one fine day there were two men in black suits who came to Kino's bar with their own drink but asked Kino if they were ready to uh, pay some fee to Kino if, they, if he allowed them to have the drink there. And Kino was like okay fine you guys have your drink but they had a bad habit of smoking and Kino didn't really like smoking but he had already given them permission and he wasn't going to tell them to go outside. What happened is eventually these two men they started having a disagreement among themselves. They started to quarrel and when this dis disagreement slowly started increasing till a length where one of them threw the ashtray on the ground and this is when Kino got aware and vigilant so he ran and he started cleaning the mess that they had made and before in, in Kino's mind he's like I got to do something about this right so he goes and he speaks to both of them and he tells these men uh, guys please keep your volume down this is what he tells them so when he tells them that he realizes that these out of these two men one man was really was really had a good build as in he wasn't tall or anything but he had good muscles he, he was nicely built and the other had a pony deal and both of them looked at Kino and said Ki, do you have uh, any trouble like are you going to tell us what to do what's the matter here and at that point Kino realized that these people weren't from Yakuza because their suits weren't that good but at the same time whatever they were doing wasn't that respectable so what he did is um, he, he started sweating and stuff at that time the man who used to sit at the same seat came in front and he was he started saying uh, please don't uh, be angry on the staff it was me who told uh, him to tell you guys to keep quiet and then the two guys were like what who are you and the guy uh, the man who sat on the same seat answered I am Kamita in the sense uh, my name is Kamita he said it's written with the characters for God Kami and field God's field but it isn't pronounced Kanda as you might expect it's pronounced Kamita thus Kino first learned his name so what happens is Kamita goes and confronts these two guys in suits right who are acting very bossy and cocky 
So he tells that. Uh, so one of the person in the suits is like, you know, what you want to confront confront us and all, right? Let's just go outside and deal with this. In the sense that they wanted to show that let's go out and we'll bash you, we'll teach you a lesson. So Kamita is like, yeah, cool, we'll do that. Just before you do that, please pay your bill. He meant like, why should we keep the staff in distress? So the two people actually pay. They pay good in the sense, but they even uh, try to mock the bar. He they try to mock Kino's bar, saying that it's super cheap. Why don't you buy better wine glass? and everything so kamita is also pretty witty because when these two people uh, in suits uh, they try to bring down kino's bar they tell things like you know oh, kino your bar is so cheap and these wine glasses are so cheap please get better wine glasses etc etc so kamita is like yes uh, cheap bar for cheap customers and the two guys in suits at this point they are super pissed with kamita so they are like yeah yeah you come outside and dude you're pretty funny dude you're like you know tu aaja bahar हम दिखाते हैं तुझे तो कमिता सर लाइक ठीक है and what happens is these uh, two men go outside and the cat who is to come there the cat also goes outside with them and then kamita also goes out what happens is for 10 minutes we don't know what has happened and 10 minutes later kamita comes inside and ki in this 10 minute kino is just waiting he seeing that kamita's book is lying over there just like a dog would wait for his master and kamita is like do you know what do this is all settled down you don't have to worry these two men and whatever the black suit shouldn't worry you after today so now kino is pretty surprised because in his head what really happened did kamita actually bash them did he kill them he doesn't know like all these thoughts are running in his mind because when he when he was a college student kino had seen a yakuza fighting with the two people and in just two blows he had knocked down both of these people and then he had kept them down by kicking them so he thought that maybe this is a possibility and because kamita always looked like a boxer so most probably you know he just uh, taught them a good lesson but kino had gone out and he had checked the neighborhood and when he checked the neighborhood he didn't really find any blood traces so or uh, even those two guys in the black suits so he was really confused at this point so as we go ahead with the story a week or so later kino meets a woman and basically he is uh, sleeping with her and she's the first woman that he has slept with since his wife and the uh, pages are basically uh, an introductory to who the woman is and you know her relationship with the previous guy and how it was a bit abusive and so on that is basically explained in the further pages the mystery that's created with this move woman is that she actually has a bit of burn marks and she normally comes with the other guy right and that they that she has actually slept with the uh, kino is because this guy is away and something has happened and kino doesn't really know what has happened and the next day she does leave and for a, a week then after a week uh, she comes with the same guy and she acts like nothing has really happened with when kino but kino knows that something has happened right and whenever he sees that he hopes that something will ag- happen again soon then after some time he has to meet his wife because by the end of summer his divorce is finalized and because his divorce is finalized he has to meet his wife so they meet at kino's bar itself and this is the conversation that they have uh, so his wife is like you know what this is a good uh, bar and etc so kino is like would you like to have something she's like a wine if uh, if you have that so and then she's like you know what Uh, I'm sorry. So he's like, for what? For hurting you? She said, you were hurt a little, weren't you? I suppose so. Kino said, after giving it some thought. I'm human after all. I was hurt, but whether it was a lot or little, I can't say. I wanted to see you and tell you I'm sorry. Kino nodded. You apologized, and I've accepted your apology. No need to worry about it anymore. I wanted to tell you what was going on, but I just couldn't find the words. But. Wouldn't we have arrived at the same place anyway? I guess so, his wife said. But I hesitated, but I hesitated, not saying anything, and we wound up here at this awful point. Kino said nothing and took a sip of wine. Actually, he was starting to forget all that had happened back then. He couldn't recall his events in the order they had occurred. It was like a mixed-up jigsaw puzzle in his mind. It's nobody's fault, he said. I shouldn't have come. home a day early or i should have let you know i was coming then we wouldn't have to go through that and honestly reading this paragraph you see how murakami paints all of his characters like it is not kino's fault in any way his wife is the one who has destroyed both of the lives in a way especially kino's life 
and uh, still you know is like you know when you love someone so deep you think of all the reasons in which you could have saved a relationship no matter how toxic and even though she was cheating on him he's like you know what maybe we could have had a relationship if only i would and have come one day earlier or if i would have told you so that you could have you know not done that thing in that specific moment and this paragraph is so i don't have the words i just you understand right uh continuing uh, his wife didn't say anything of course kaise bolegi <laughs> when did you start seeing the guy kino asked i don't think we should get into that better for me not to know you mean his wife said nothing maybe you are right about that kino admitted he kept on petting the cat which purred deeply another first maybe i don't have the right to say this this woman has form of wife said but i think it be good for you to forget about what happened and find someone new conveniently and this is something that you know i struggled a lot with and uh something that had made me prejudiced against girls and for a long time i felt that it was so hard to find someone who would really be committed or really be loyal because that's what people do they cheat and that is something that i really find hard to deal with and that's why i find relationships so uh, very weird in a way maybe kino said so after that con- confrontation with his wife his wife conveniently acts like you know everything is okay and she acts like she's really sad but we all know that it's just us trying to feel less guilty about all the wrong that we have done so she's trying to feel less guilty but at the same time she wants to be happy so she's trying to apologize as much as she can or uh, that scene ends and then eventually we are taken to a new scene where murakami writes about how uh, kino starts to observe most next to uh, in his house uh, next to his house in a span of 7 days he you know observed three snakes outside his house that's what murakami writes and uh, kino doesn't understand this so he calls up his aunt uh, so he calls up his aunt to figure out is everything okay like uh, does this place have a snake problem and his aunt is like in so many years that i have lived there i have never seen any snake there so it is pretty unusual that you are seeing three snakes in a span of 7 days so kino's like okay and they have like you know a mythological talk saying that his aunt is like you know a snake may actually guide you uh, or there is other uh, legend say that the snakes guide you but then they we don't know where they might guide you the direction might be good or the direction might be bad so it's ambiguous so he was like okay so even when he went to sleep he felt like there was a presence of snakes filled in his house and uh, that's when uh, after some time kamita appears again to the bar this chapter wasn't really what i expected to be as in you know the previous uh, chapters when you read it they would make you think but you would understand the story you would understand the characters it would just make you think on a personal level and on a deeper level but this story that is kino chapter 5 it actually has a very uh, confusing ending so what happens is basically kino s- uh, sleeps with a woman who had scars on her body and those scars were basically cigarette scars that her boyfriend had left on her so that meaning that she was in a traumatic relationship she was in a toxic relationship and what he should have done is he should have saved her and if even if he couldn't have saved her he should have tried to see you know what the issue was but because he hadn't really you know confronted his own emotions he was at this point really empty he was scared to confront any kind of emotions at a where at a uh, at you know at some level he was full of rage he was full of hate he was full of sadness but he wouldn't know because he wouldn't want to confront any emotions he didn't want to confront happiness also he was just empty his heart was empty so when his wife asked him that uh, you are sad uh, weren't you sad when you seen me uh, you know cheating on you and he said like uh, yeah i was little sad after all i'm human but the truth is he wasn't as sad as he should have been he didn't remove his anger he didn't do anything and even his wife expected him to act in a way because it's not normal because if you have loved someone so much you would go completely crazy seeing uh, such a thing happening right in front of you so even his wife was honestly just scared for him because he didn't do what's normal what a normal human being would do he just went out of there he didn't you know abuse her he didn't you know 
he just didn't do anything he just left there and he never uh, you know came back to his house and what happened is when he had the time to you know uh, know this uh, new girl that he uh, met who had uh, cigarette scars on her body he could have seen he could have maybe even saved her but he didn't so kamita basically he come kamita comes in the bar again and he tells you know you know what it's time you know that you have to shut down this bar there is something wrong and you know couldn't really understand and kamita is like you know you know i know you're not the person who would do willfully something that's wrong but even not doing something when something wrong is happening that is wrong too Look, when you can do the things that I can, but you don't, and then the bad things happen, they happen because of you. So basically, when something wrong is happening, and you, when you don't, when you don't, you know, bring that into light, when you just let wrong happen, when you don't confront wrong, and when you do not fight wrong, that is wrong too. so that meaning that you know he should have uh, saved uh, that girl who had cigarette scars and you know because love entered his life after so long his wife cheated on him and most probably you know you this girl who had the cigarette scars on her body maybe she was a love of his life but we would never know now because he didn't do anything he to save her or talk and that's what it is and eventually we realize so it's just about so then uh, kamita is like you know dude you need to roam more you just go and we have a scene is created in the sense like maybe he's going to be killed but it's not really that it's more about on the subconscious level and basically uh, murakami is known for magical realism so in the end what happens is uh, uh kino is in a room in a dark room and he actually confronts all his feelings he's crying there because it's all just too much so that's basically the whole story <laughs> yeah, cool i think we also we are live ka oh, what's up man i'm <laughs> <laughs> not live i know right i mean oh, so yeah. i think so i i just go into that mode i'm pretty much excited i have the book actually beside me hopefully uh i'm going to try this level best yes here it is is it clear yes for the first ho oh, ho oh, oh, ho oh, that's nice that's nice so Because basically according why wouldn't i keep the book next to me i know i wanted i was checking my quotes reference basically the last page that's what i do and sadly with kino i didn't really highlight anything Oh, that's a good idea. They have blank pages also. They no thought of that. Do right. Yeah, they do. I never noticed that. It's for notes and all. Right, right, right. Should keep that in mind. I still do scribble. Mm-hmm. I used to scribble in between the books, and I'm like, eh, I'm spoiling the book, and that's why I stopped that. Mm, I I think so. I most of my uh, what do you say highlights were from the first chapter. uh the car one and um, what do you say the fans kafka one what was it no samson love yeah yeah samson love so i think so the yeah. oh, i liked all of them all were fantastic ones I don't know how could anyone write such good ones but they all were fantastic <laughs> and i think we'll definitely make a video on each one of them i was i think so from two or three days i've been researching a lot on like murakami like i wanted to know mm-hmm. like who is murakami what so if you go to see honestly speaking there aren't like video essays on his book so you know even chapters i think kafka on the shore um i haven't read it have you read it no not yet that looks very dense i know right so that has like a video a and uh, I'm not sure about Norwegian wood, but I think so Norwegian wood because it's the book which made him Mainstream. like Murakami. I think so. It should have one video essay. Yeah, the Otherwise, there are nothing. There's nothing on the internet. There's a lot of reviews though. Yeah, but again, like, uh, I think so. What we will be doing now would be super interesting because nothing is there on the internet, right? And I'm actually excited for that. Hope so. <laughs> thing so, is 
i i i don't know i in my mind i was like you know how would I, how would i do it like you know because there is no interview questions nothing is set and um, you were like dry run let's have a dry run and everything so i was pretty much confused and like i only wanted to ask you like what drew you more closer to the chapter kino rather than all the other chapters oh no i liked all of them i okay. liked all of them but kino was something that i yeah kino it dealt with the topic of running away from your emotions mm-hmm. and that was something that like connected with but all of them were fantastic ones huh. but yeah the whole idea where he was being this hard ass and he was trying to suppress his emotions and he ran away to the safe mm-hmm. space which was not wrong that's what fascinated me because i feel that's what i do sometimes i run away to the safe space mm-hmm. where i escape hoping i'll just forget about my emotions but yeah we all know how it ends i know that th- that's the best part right i i sometimes see what i used to think is like do we take something like this like an as an individual uh, philosophy like you know what you said and we end it at that or then we take it something that's more than an individual like everyone in general runs away from their problems right there's a tendency as a human tendency to do that mm-hmm. and uh, it's like the confusion like i it's like what at the end of the day i don't think that murakami must have thought like you know the readers are going to think about his book in this sense or so deeply also so i think that is fascinating to me no i don't know what murakami thinks of i know right because, because i i didn't know that he owned a bar and everything then i realized ki okay the you know murakami the murakami owned a bar yeah yeah so you don't know so basically no, no, not know. um he he even studied drama he wanted to be a filmmaker or something i'm not sure about this but he uh, took he studied drama for one year at waseda university or something like that and that's where that's oh, where he was pardon i thought you were going to say wasai university i'm like <laughs> i wish huh. then Wasai. i'm sure the books wouldn't be that <laughs> yeah when you say this japanese name it doesn't come out properly right yeah because like i'm sure when you say that mm-hmm. kamita or whatever I mean, oh yeah, Kamita. Kamita. She sounds like some bio or something. <laughs> Kamita, I, Kamita. I forgot about that. Honestly speaking, and I was like, I just I was glancing uh, through the pages, right? And I was like, Kamita. Okay, this this character also yeah, exists yeah. in the story. Like I I just remember like the main points, like you said. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he went for drama school and everything. One year he did that, and then later he found his wife there basically, and he opened a jazz bar. and uh, yeah and for I a lot of bar ones you want to own a beach house you want to own a bar you decide what do you want ah, to own basically basically <laughs> i'm you know i want to escape somewhere <laughs> beat a bar or beat a resort it's my escape i guess that's I like, the whole that's why i did with kino like, i like when i look at your screen also i can look at this waves and that it looks and you are in that scene bro i swear <laughs> dream yeah escape probably meet a kamita or then telling me to run away soon what did you uh, i don't know so the thing is um, should we explain the story or what should we do like for the viewers here wouldn't uh, what should we do like should i tell them to watch this video the kino one which i made or should we talk about like we need to give context right because honestly no, speaking, i don't know how you will explain it right you will do explain everything because honestly speaking i don't know how i'm going to edit this specific video so that's one, another thing I don't want to tell. Give us a segue. Take a look at this video, and we'll recoup later. I know, right? Because that's the reason I never did the introduction. You know, I'm talking with Kian. This is what the episode is all about. I was like, I think so. That's something for later, and it just it works as a hindrance, right? Between if we aren't used to it. Give us a segue now. Play the video, I guess. <laughs> uh, where were we? We were just talking about uh, yeah, yeah. this thing. But like I feel the whole thing turns is when he meets his wife in the bar. He turns as in how I I'm just you know remembering everything. Yeah, till then it was a safe place. Everything was fine. Oh I yes, was happy yes, 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 yes. And then yes. finally he meets her and mm-hmm. she's like, "Are you hot?" And then he's just like, "No, not that much. I'm human. I'm half human. I'm obviously I'm hot." <laughs> But he was still hiding his things. he never confronted those feelings and that's the thing right a lot yeah. of people when we say right ki i have moved on i have moved on 
and it's so easier to say that you have moved on from that person when you haven't let's say seen her for a year or two or let's say she has blocked you right and that's easier mm-hmm. to say but what happens when you say you moved on but that person is exactly in front of you <laughs> Gets us the million dollar question. I right? know, right? So it's so easy, like to say, yeah, yeah, I'm moved on, I'm moved on, and when that person exactly in front of you, like, how would you react? That's pretty crazy. That's true. But the I never understood what Murakami did with the Yakuza. Um, uh, what do you say? Um, alignment there. Oh, so that whole thing, what I believe is basically they were showing the contrast between mm-hmm. Kamita and Kino. Okay. So what I understood was that Kino was this very shy person who would hide from his feelings. He wouldn't take action on his stuff. Mm-hmm. Whereas Kamita, like he took action. Okay. He saw something wrong and he just, he was brave and he fought it. In fact, he was the one who saw something wrong with Kino and he just told him, get out of here. Yeah. To so basically so, the Yakuza was like a plot tool just to like, uh, make us realize that. Yeah. That Kamita is someone uh. who takes action. He doesn't just sit quietly and, you know, just mm-hmm. let things go by. He takes action. In fact, I think some of the best lines came from Kamita only. He, I wish I would have highlighted some of those or, you know, did yeah, some like, research. I think I have one year. So he says, Mr. Kino, you're not the type who would willingly do something wrong. I know that very well, but there are times in this world when it's not enough, just not to do the wrong thing. Oh, when it's yes, not enough, yes, just yes, not yes, to do yes, the wrong yes, thing. Yes, yes, yes. I remember in the video, I used the Spider-Man reference. Right. Yeah. Some yeah. people use that blank space as a loophole. <laughs> It, it's just that it reminds me of like politics and everything, right? Like, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> I seen this one quote on Instagram and this girl had posted a post where she's like, it's not, I think ignoring what's happening in the world or not participating in uh, politics is a privilege. And that mm. got me thinking, honestly, I haven't like formulated my opinions on this, but mm-hmm. yeah, it does remind me of this. <laughs> Yeah, that's like like someone's dying in front of you and they ask for help and you don't help them. Basically, you kill them, right? (laughs) Yeah. You could have saved them by not doing anything. You're basically... Mm -hmm. You're part of the crime crime as much as as, uh, the person who committed the crime. Exactly. And I guess that was the whole point of all this. So he just created the safe place and he just ran away. And even Kamita says that I felt so comfortable here and I realized it was way too comfortable. Everyone felt comfortable, including you. So that's when he realized, like, look, this was his safe space. And other people felt comfortable because he made it comfortable. But I, what I, the thing is, um, so basically nothing in life can be, uh, be all peace, right? I, um, this mm-hmm. is going back to Jordan Peterson. He basically gives a, a reference to the Garden of Eden. And mm-hmm. um, I'm really sorry if I can't explain it well. So according to my understanding, he's like the garden of Eden should have been like the most perfect place, right? Where nothing goes wrong and everything is all right. But basically the garden chaos, even however perfect a place is basically chaos still creeps in and hence, you know, the eating of the forbidden fruit and, you know, hiding away from God and everything. And I believe like whatever escape room he chose, chaos was still creeping him, right? He could not like just uh, go away. Like he had to meet his wife. He had to like meet other people in the end. So yeah. that I think so. Um, what would have been fun was to see that him not going into rooms and everything, but you know, actually staying in the cafe or whatever that he built and chaos continuously creeping in. Then that's how he realizes in the same place. But I think so he, that couldn't be done because uh, the cafe stood as a safe place, right? Yeah, that was a safe haven. Mm-hmm. Like if he confronted reality within a safe haven, that wouldn't make sense. He had to run away and like be completely vulnerable away mm-hmm. from his safe zone. But the beauty about the safe zone was being in that safe zone, he let other people go to ruin. That's something I found fascinating. Pardon, pardon? No. By staying in that safe zone, he was so numb to everything, he let mm-hmm. other people go and ruin. The woman he met? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think think Kamita or something, he tells him about this, right? Or uh, Murakami writes it as a narration. It's possible, but we do find out about the cigarette burns and we notice the woman has her own story. 
but you know so numb to that he didn't save her he didn't do anything about it he just let exactly maybe i think you told me this but yeah she, I, she could have life. been the love of his life right. basically and there was so much opportunity to for him to find basically in a way even he was abused in love and what the same thing was happening with her and this was his opportunity to you know find a person and you know connect with one person who would understand him more than anyone else and uh, like his way to save someone but he couldn't do that because he was so aloof and like you know exactly right. like you said in a safe haven and yeah she wanted to be saved probably and just because like, he was yeah. comfortable he didn't save someone so that's when you i noticed like there is a downside to escaping mm. you become numb and you lose things that maybe matter i don't know if i'm uh, quoting this right i think so uh, there's this quoted dear zindagi have you seen the movie sharukh khan and alia bhat seen it i don't think i'll know the quote uh, so i think so she's like she talks she says something and he's like there's a problem with knowing yourself too much because if you know yourself too much you don't want to know basically others and you're at peace with yourself so you don't really care too much about someone else something like this i don't know if you remember but yeah it reminded me of this like if someone could put it in the comment section that would have been amazing <laughs> but he knew himself like i don't think he knew himself he was just blank right yeah yeah you know, that's um, that's the what do you say a completely different uh, what do you say side of the story but mm. yeah he didn't know himself definitely no in fact one of my favorite lines from kamita is this was a comfortable place not just for me but for anybody yeah that was a fascinating line i think kamita stood out from this whole story yeah i don't I mean, know who he was i thought he was some supernatural being the way he kept on explaining his name i uh, don't know what that story was i wonder what that was no no i don't think so there is any magical reason to do it yeah oh yeah something that i wanted to talk about is uh so for a long time i honestly didn't know what magical realism is i knew the word existed and everything but exactly what it meant i didn't know and we've been talking about murakami right and you told me and everyone that's a specialty right magical realism yeah. so but what that's very less in norwegian words by the way pardon which is yeah yeah, yeah. i was seeing a review words. and uh, the, the girl was like you know what if someone wants to start with uh, what do you say what a murakami you guys should start with norwegian wood because that's the least magical realism the, uh, there is in that right. book so what is exactly magical realism to you to me it's basically when reality gets mixed with fantasy which is basically what the word means <laughs> yeah. magical realism or fantastical yeah. realism but <laughs> it blurs the line so much you don't know what is reality anymore what is not so i'll give you an example from one of my favorite books a wild mm-hmm. sheep chase so that is stating... also from murakami right definitely definitely yeah, yeah. that's yeah. i think one of the one of the first it's right behind books. you in fact in the this thing where is it in left, your right background hand. because this is all like ulta sulda <laughs> for me right right so it's there behind you but yeah okay. that's one of the first books i read i used to go on this long runs and i used to just listen to the audio book and oh. i just liked it and i picked that up Uh-huh. And yeah, basically, he's dating this girl, and she just disappears. Basically, it was Talash. She turned out oh to be a ghost or what not. Are but... you fuck you, dude? Don't give me that spoiler. <laughs> no, she's nothing. I don't. Okay, I okay. I still don't understand what it was. She's not even a ghost. Yeah. I just don't know what it was. And it just it's just weird. And then he goes in search of her, and she's a sheep, but she's not mm-hmm. a sheep, and you don't know. But at the end, whatever happens, the main protagonist ends up discovering themselves or maybe not basically just uh-huh. go on a circle and they end up I where they are but you've just been to this wild journey like i haven't read most of murakami's book i've just read one that is men without women and something that i realized is that with murakami it is with this book it's not about the ending right it's never about the ending it's hmm. exactly about what the uh, characters feeling like to explain loneliness and alienation in such a manner is like you know i'm honestly envious because he could like do it so it's just amazing to me and that's what i'd, I'd like to take it one step further i don't mm-hmm. think he kind of writes down about loneliness i think okay. that's just a by product but what i love about it is how he explains everyday life 
Hmm. His books are just normal. Sometimes I wonder why am I reading this? You're just seeing a woman making toast in the kitchen, or huh. making a cup of tea and drinking hmm. it, or like you told me, this guy who shaves for forty minutes. He just uh-huh. looks at himself in the mirror. Like it's such ordinary tasks that he writes down, and loneliness just seems to be a byproduct of all of that. Because uh, we as humans are inherently lonely. <laughs> when we are alone, yeah, nice. all we are is lonely. Yeah. The thing is, where he shaves for forty minutes, that isn't a byproduct. I think so. He had to write it in a way to show that that character is lonely. But I get what you're saying is because all of Murakami's characters are ordinary people, right? Uh, let's say Very. a student, a normal going student, and like it's not like you know your uh, Riverdale kind of characters. Like it's not over the top shit. Right. I do get that. It's not. It's we are not reading Iron Man. We are not reading Batman. We are just reading you, you and me. and i think so that's the thing right why are we investing some our time in reading you know a normal person's life like ha huh, i got a way to say that normally when we write story uh, when we write stories there has to be a moment where if i don't save someone it it either you know damages my world the world is all dead or it you know my girlfriend is dead or my family member is dead so the risk and the action that i have to take matters a lot but in murakami's books i don't think so that's necessarily there right yeah i don't know whether it even has like a whole storyline or what what's it called the arc oh yeah arc yeah i don't know whether he has a story arc i'd like to explore he has kino has a story arc A character yeah, arc. Has, but the other ones, I wonder whether they do. They definitely do on some level. But mm-hmm. I wonder whether they have the story or the hero arc, or do they have something mm-hmm. in particular? Because yeah. they just seem like slice of life. You know, the characters just go on with their days. Yes. Yeah. Eventually, in the middle, there comes a climax. But like, especially in Norwegian words and all, it just seems he's living his life. We're just following. The like Murakami is just following this guy and just writing what he's doing on like, a daily basis, like a journal entry in a way. Yeah, in a way, like a journal entry, and I, that's the reason I like this fantastical reality <laughs> because Murakami plots everyday life in such a way, way, and the characters are so aloof to everything. When they come and face with this fantastical reality, they don't really care <laughs> because for them, ordinary life is so weird. This fantastical reality or this fantasy world is just the same. <laughs> Like in a wild sheep chase, uh, this guy falls in love with this girl. Yeah. And what he loved about her was her ears. That's okay. All. That's it. And you just think about it, like the human ear is such a weird organ, the shape, yeah. the way it is. He's huh. like, why is it not a cone? Why is it the way it is? And mm-hmm. it's so weirdly shaped. And he liked her earlobes. And the okay. way her ears move. Uh-huh. I just thought how weird the human ear is. Huh. And yeah, because I'm just like normally you would uh, say something like the eyes, right? Because we were stereotyped the eyes for a symbol of love, yeah. right? And it the not ear. the eyes but the ear, yeah, pretty. I just look at my ears in the mirror and I'm like, it's a very weird organ to have. It doesn't have any reasonable shape. It could just be a cone or it could be a circle, but no, it's mm-hmm. shaped in a very weird way. And after thinking about yours for so long, and then you meet this weird goat man in space, it feels <laughs> normal to him. It's like how oh, yours are more fascinating than this, and that's what I like about Murakami. So basically, what I read about magical realism was that the author, whoever is writing, um, who is whoever is making magical realism a part of his book, doesn't go to explain whatever is magical realism. Like, let's say if there are fairies in that world, the author doesn't explain why there is fairies, just to show that mm-hmm. that is a normal thing in their world. And mm. because their life, because their world is so similar to ours, it's like basically okay. Now even fairies are a part of our world, so that right. is pretty cool. Yeah, that is. But it sets uh-huh. what sets magical realism apart from like normal fantasy is like Harry Potter. Like hmm. yeah, fairies do exist in Harry Potter, but you know that's fantasy. Whereas in hmm. fantastical realism, this logic applies to only a few characters. It's not like a normal hmm. thing in the world. It only usually applies to the protagonist and maybe someone close to them. So yeah. it's only different for them, and everyone thinks probably they're crazy or they don't understand them to the fullest. Hmm. That's what I think sets fantastical realism. Because apart. when I read about that, it made me think about the snakes that Kino sees right outside the bar, and I don't hmm. think it's a part of magical realism. Like, 
it's just snakes right yeah but there are no snakes like his aunt out of the blue you mean like out of the blue right. for him to see snakes all around this house yeah right mm. unless some guy with a big snake <laughs> came and snakes <laughs> like, yeah, now kavi kavita behind the scenes is like this guy needs to take some action he needs to learn a lesson let's throw snakes <laughs> all over the place kill the cat Lord. so yeah i feel that was a manifestation of his subconscious mm-hmm. which maybe yeah. was all in his head maybe it was really the snakes but either ways it was not it's not normal when yeah. you feel blue it doesn't really rain but in this case he was hiding from something and something did manifest mm-hmm. out of nowhere i so basically when i was researching i realized that haruki murakami used to uh, read a lot of crime or thriller books and that was like his favorite genre so has he written any book of the same like in the thriller or crime genre i don't think so but he does have a lot of non fiction books that got to do with the sarin attack in the tokyo subways they put gas and all that he That's has like two books. non fiction books now one is him about running and another, another one i don't really remember i think it's 1q something like that now 1q oh 1q98 i something like some number with the q in it that for sure uh, yeah yeah also, it's 1q a48 or 84 right Yeah. Huh, there's a non-fiction absolutely on music conversations with Seiji Ozawa mm-hmm. underground the Tokyo gas attack and the Japanese psyche okay and what i talk about when i talk about running i like like a, a lot of i know like for sure like everything that he has written there has to be a part of him there like in the sense it's not just one character that he imagined and then mm. he put his traits i know that this is murakami somewhere there and these are his traits you know because of the bar the running mm. and so much and that's how he just merging himself with the characters and a lot right. of artists do that that's really fascinating to me i think so that is something that we should try yeah that's why i want to live my life to the fullest so we have experiences <laughs> to pass on i don't think you need to do that i think so like i said right there are three things constant in life that is pain a change and uh, what was the third one shit i forgot my own sayings so pain is constant in life and till there is pain i think so you can keep writing about stuff yeah probably death pain That's change really death cool. yes three constants of life have you started writing though i want to make a video only like talking about like what you wrote and like you know that would be really fun I have started writing. I'm heavily influenced. I feel by Murakami only at the end okay. of the day. You know, mm-hmm. just slice of life stuff, everyday stuff. Just mm-hmm. try it for fun. And let's see where it goes. I don't think I can capture the way he captures ordinary daily life, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to do that. You know, just basic everyday things. The way he describes it, it's really beautiful. Because I believe so. Like I said, every like the ordinary things they are just like they aren't there for time pass, right? like a lot of books could just a lot of authors could write ordinary life that should be easy to them i think so he uses that as a tool to signify loneliness or you said it's a by product but i believe like in my opinion he does this to highlight the loneliness or he does that to show us what's actually how the character is like so that we get aligned with the end philosophy of the story so i think you could try that it's possible i guess i'm i'm falling in the trap of what normal indians fall into as in i mean to say like think about murakami's books what do you like most about it it's the ordinary at least what i like most about it is the ordinary things he took this mm-hmm. tokyo line to tokyo or shinigawa or whatever the places are mm-hmm. so imagine like kian took the borivli train to church gate okay, like i yeah. have to put this kind of everyday things that i experience but i don't do this i want to make it really western types Yeah. Maybe I think yeah. what Murakami captures is the essence of Tokyo life of Japanese life. Mm. I need to capture that essence of Indian life which I'm not doing just because I think it's too cheap maybe or I don't think it's worth writing. No, about. I think so because as that. artist we aren't really you know I wouldn't say taught that but we won't take inspiration from that because if you go to see Japanese literature anime the and uh, their anime movies it's all so much focused on their culture. like you know right. the cinematography they they actually want you to love japan and yeah but their culture anime. comes from their experiences also right like mm-hmm. i cannot write an anime because i have no experience about japan mm-hmm. 
so i guess a lot of their writings come from experience personal experience that is any form of art right that is that's right. where the whole uh, you writing the story comes that's true so that's what i feel like i need to take more of my personal experiences like murakami had a bar i need to i run you know i run so yeah. maybe i need to i've not read i have the book what i think about when i think about running i have the book i want to read it but it's basically that only what he thinks about when he thinks about running <laughs> and i want to do that as well like i run i want to document my personal experience yeah but that's again like a non fiction book i I'd really like to read a book that you wrote, uh, wrote about a uh, fiction a uh, fictional book in a sense you know that would be in fact i'm reading a lovely book right now called sputnik sweetheart murakami oh, again yeah 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 what's it about and Oh, it's very fascinating i think i'm enjoying it right now at the stage i am in life it okay. has two topics one is about sexual desire okay and the second is about this writer who can't write okay um uh, it's the same person she also writes as block same. yeah okay she writes a lot and then she falls in love with someone mm-hmm. and then she gets the writer's block and this person tells her like You just don't have enough life experience yet. You get the experience, okay. writing will come automatically and I feel that's what I am. Like you said I want to write about the resort and all. Yeah. But I don't have that experience yet. Yeah. Cool. I wanted to make a episode on anime. Let's see if I can call Kia or Kenneth or someone too. Let's see. That would be fun. I'll post. Cool. Chill, chill, chill. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Take a good night. Bye.